I am beyond excited to be interviewing Emma Burquist on the channel today. Emma is a young adult author of Devils Unto Dust, a western zombie novel for young adults, and also Missing Presumed Dead, which is a murder mystery ghost story also for young adults. We had such a fantastic conversation about tapping into primal human fears in order to scare your readers the most. So if you are interested in learning how to write horror and learning how to scare your readers, I highly recommend watching this video until the end. I personally learned so much from Emma and I know that you will too. So without further ado, let's welcome Emma to the channel. Emma, thank you so much for coming to the channel and chatting with me today. I'm so excited to talk to you about writing and ghosts and horror. Could you start by maybe telling us a little bit about yourself? So I, I grew up in Austin, Texas um, and uh, went to school here, high school and went to college in San Antonio. And then um, after that, I moved around a lot. So I've lived in a lot of different places, uh, California for a bit, I lived in Singapore for a bit, um, oh, wow. I went to New Zealand for a bit, and now I'm finally back in Texas. So I, I just, I bounce around a lot. I like to live new places and try new foods. So um, yeah, but I'm happy to be back in Texas now for, uh, yeah, this wonderful time that we're having. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, and what, what have you published? What Can you tell me a little bit about um, your So book? I have two books. My first book is a sort of zombie Western and that's set in Texas. And that one's called Devils Unto Dust. And then my second book is Missing Presumed Dead. And that's sort of a, um, I wanna call it like a neo-noir ghost story, um, but also kind of a love story. And that one is set in Los Angeles. Awesome, very cool. Yeah, I'm halfway through Missing Presumed Dead right now and I'm just absolutely loving it. <laughs> So, right. so oh, good. good. <laughs> yeah. So what is your favorite thing about horror and what initially drew you to it? Um, I just, you know, I would watch a lot of horror movies when I was a kid. Well, things scared me a lot when I was a kid. I was a very nervous, kind of anxious kid. And I think watching scary movies was a way for me to sort of control that fear mm -hmm. because it was something scary, but I knew that it couldn't hurt me and that there was an end point and a conclusion coming and then you could turn off the TV and go away. So it, I think it was sort of a, a cathartic way for me to um, deal with my, my anxiety. Yeah. Um, and then I just kind of really liked the adrenaline rush you can get from horror. I always compare it to like when you're when you're on a roller coaster and you're like going up, 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 up and like you know the drop is coming and it's the uh -huh. same feeling you get when you're watching a horror movie and it's like you know there's a jump stare coming and you're just waiting for it, but it it still gets you, and it's just that little like rush. Yeah, I just no, always, I was always like that. I always thought it was like just a fun fun way to like sort of hijack your brain. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so interesting. I hear that a lot from authors that like it's always a way for them to manage anxiety, and like the interplay yeah, between horror and anxiety is so interesting because horror is like meant to instill fear and anxiety in readers, but people right, who but it's, already it's, feel it like it's can find comfort these, in it. Yeah, it's these within these parameters, like it's a world that you're creating. And, you know, usually in a horror movie, like you defeat the bad guy or you get away. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of like this resolution to it as opposed to real, real world anxiety, which is very nebulous and like never ending. And you can't yeah. control it. Definitely. Did you always know that you wanted to be a writer? I didn't really think of writing as being um, something that people like me could do, I guess. Um, it always seemed sort of like a pipe dream or it was like, that was something that like famous authors did. That wasn't something, mm -hmm. that, you know, I could do just, you know, some like nobody. Um, and I, I didn't think I could do it until I actually wrote my first book, which I wrote because I wasn't really doing anything else at the time and mostly because I was bored. And I, I mean, I'd always written like short prose pieces and, and essays and stuff and, and poetry, but I'd never written a complete book before. And it sort of was just a, a challenge for myself as, as a project. And right. the book was terrible. It was just, it was just absolutely awful. Um, but I finished it and it was long and I was like, oh, if you actually sit down and do it, it is possible to write a complete book. And you know, whether or not that book is good is a different thing. But once you know that you can do it, it becomes something that you think is you know possible and so mm -hmm. then the second book I wrote is what became Doubles Unto Dust and at that right. point I was like oh I'm gonna I'm gonna try this because I've dedicated a lot of time to it and mm -hmm. it still kind of feels like a pipe dream but you know it people people but you're do doing it, it. it <laughs> No, I mean, finishing the first book is honestly like the hardest part of the process. Yeah, yeah. And and I mean, every time you start a new book, it does feel like it's like, how do I do this? What am I doing? This is yeah. impossible. But like, in, I'm hoping eventually that feeling goes away when you write enough books. But 
we're still kind of waiting on it. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> so what did your writing education look like when you, like when you first decided that you wanted to start writing that first book? How did you learn how to write books and what resources did you use? Well, so I, I was an English major, so I read a lot <laughs> in college. And I read, yeah, yeah. Okay. Are. Um, <laughs> I mean, I really didn't think I was going to use it for writing. I thought I was just going to use it to, I don't know, be a barista, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, so I read a lot of the classics and, you know, that really taught me a lot about uh, sort of analyzing work and literary criticism. Um, but honestly, I would say that the, the way that I learned to write was by reading. I mean, just I've, I've always been an avid reader. And so I learned about story structure and, you know, about characterization, things like that, just from, from being an avid reader and the rest of it um, learned from, from talking to other writers. Um, that more so about like the actual process like I don't think it's hard to kind of teach you how to put together a story that you learn from reading enough stories to understand how it works but the actual like, well here's what you do you sit down you, you hit a word count pantsers plotters those kinds of things the like sort of nitty-gritty details I learned from from talking to other writers no it's, I mean and there's like so much out there now that's available like from like online courses and YouTube yeah and yeah and there's like a, lot of a lot of and you know I I when I started writing, I wasn't, you know, active in a lot of those communities. And it, it just really has been helpful to be able to connect with other writers and, and you know, sort of commiserate over, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the ups and downs of it. Um, it. And to have sort of like cheerleaders in your corner who understand the process and how hard it is. Definitely. Yeah. So with horror, horror is a genre that kind of is dependent or at least like often, I don't want to say like relies on, but you find a lot of tropes in horror. And I feel like horror books are shaped around tropes sometimes more than like tropes in other genres. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you interact with tropes and whether you isolate ones that you like before you start writing or if you like to subvert them or if you just kind of ignore them and write the stories you want. How do you use them? I mean, I, I like, um, I mean, yeah, horror, I think is very trope heavy. You have a lot of um, different types of stories. Um, you have, you know, paranormal, you have slashers, you have the torture porn, which I'm not as big of a fan of, like things that are very, like you can fit them into very clear sort of genre labels. Um, and then you have a lot of characters that are, that are archetypes. And right. um, I am a fan of a lot of that. Like I love I love anything with a final girl. I always think that's a lot of fun. Um, and I like one of the reasons I write sort of young, young adult is because it it works particularly well with with sort of that classic horror genre where you have like a group of teenagers. If you look at right. Halloween, Friday the 13th, you know, Sleepaway Camp, Scream, like it's all, you know, teenagers because there's right. this sort of in between of um, you're adult enough to be on your own in a house, like house sitting or drinking or, or doing those kinds of things. But you're still young enough that you don't really know what to do in, in certain situations. Like right. you don't have adult supervision, but you, you still want to turn to a parent. So it's just a good age, I think, to put people in these like high pressure situations. Um, Definitely. So I think that that's a pretty classic trip that I, that I like to use. Um, and then, but I like to, I like to blend genres. I think it's a lot of fun to do things that are like, you know, not, not just a zombie or like a, a, a pandemic kind of thing, but also combine that, you know, put it in a setting that, um, you know, where I grew up in as like a Western and like an old timey Western. Right. And with, with, you know, the, the ghost story, I, I wanted it to be like this murder mystery, but then also kind of a love story. Um, right. And I, I just, so I like sort of weaving things together and sometimes it works. And then sometimes I have to like, like, oh, those genres don't go together, but <laughs> you know, we're, we're working on it. Well, that's a way you can find originality in the stories too. Like if you're just sticking so, to one yeah. genre and one expectation, then, you know, it might be similar to things that other people have already read, but you can take what's familiar and combine it with other familiar things to create something completely unique, which is really cool. Yeah. You just, it, it's a lot of fun to sort of, you know, watch classic movies or classic horror movies and, and like sort of strip them for parts, combine them with other things. And yeah, have yeah, yeah. A new idea. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Do you have a book of yours out of your two that scares you more? I, I am always more afraid of the supernatural than the natural. <laughs> so ghosts freak me out a lot more than something like a killer with a knife or um, right. because like in, 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 in Devils, the, the zombies aren't, they're not like um, the undead. They're just like infected um, with sort of like a rabies-like virus. So it just right. makes them sort of feral. To me, though, ghosts are scarier because you can't always, you can't fight them. 
you can't always see them. You don't know what they want. And it's how do you, you know, like a guy you can just punch, you know, like, yeah, right. you might get killed by Michael Myers or something, but like, you can't <laughs> fight him. You can't fight a phantom, you know, right. like you got to figure out other ways to, to get rid of that. So that always creeps me out. Yeah. It's like that whole unknown, like the element of the unknown in horror. Like if you don't yeah. know what it is, then you don't have any power to like fight it or anything. So you're just kind of yeah. at it. And it's like, I mean, you know, it's like if something can move through a wall and, and like, there's no way you can get away from it. Like there's nowhere yeah. to run from sort of the supernatural. Speaking of ghosts in your book, Missing Presumed Dead, which, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm reading right now and absolutely hooked into, you feature ghosts in this really unique and um, sensory way and I was super fascinated while reading about it when you talk about like the energy and the warmth and the weight of all of the ghosts and how your main character can touch them I was wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit about how you went about building that ghost world because building a ghost world is so hard there are so many different things you have to think about and how you know you have to decide whether they can walk through walls whether they can't walk through walls if there's anything that can stop them so what was your process for developing that like well I tried well I wanted to come up with something that was sort of a, a original something that I hadn't seen a ton of um, and then I tried to think of it in sort of a very I don't want to say scientific because I'm not <laughs> like this doesn't you know really work in a scientific way but I tried to think of it in in what my mind is a scientific way which was like what what could you know in a feasible sense be the reason that we have ghosts and I thought that uh, one thing that you know made sense to me was that they were a form of energy so I started sort of looking into um, different types of energy and came up with this idea of that they're, they're kinetic energy. And when I think of energy, I think of like heat and electricity. Right. And so I thought, well, okay, so maybe if ghosts are a type of electricity, mm -hmm. that would mean that they wouldn't be cold. They would be hot because it would right. be this sort of elec electric sort of neon heat coming off of them. And, and so that sort of led me to, they would be hot. They would, they would smell like electricity or taste like electricity. Um, I kind of just built on that and then tried to come up with very sort of practical, reasonable things that they could affect and things that they could not affect. So if, if they're right. energy, they could maybe affect other things that were composed of energy, mm -hmm. like certain people or like certain things that have, were connected to um, technology or to electricity, uh, but they wouldn't be able to, you know, hold on to objects because objects don't have, you know, any, any energy when they're not moving. So right. things like that. And it's kind of building on that and trying to make it if it made sense in my head, then it would make sense in the world of the book. Right. My reasoning was. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I caught the mention of um, what was like the first law of thermodynamics in there. Yeah, um, yeah. So I tried to kind of, I was like, and I've always had sort of a weakness at science. It's like a subject that doesn't make a lot of sense. I can't wrap my brain around it very well. Mm. Like I can deal with math. Math, there is like solving for one answer, it's, it's like taking an equation, solving for X. With science, there are always these multiple forces acting at the same time. You know, you're, there's, there's gravity, there's energy and momentum and, and velocity and all these things that I can't keep track of in my head. And, you know, it doesn't really make sense to me. It's like, I see, I see a car, it's just a car. It's like, I don't understand how if it's moving forward, there's also forces pressing down. So this was my opportunity to kind of try and explain science in a way that made sense to me. <laughs> and yeah. so I was like, okay, reading about thermodynamics, that makes sense. Or reading about entropy, I can kind of get behind that. Yeah. <laughs> now you have this really great mention in the book of, I think, like talking about how ghosts don't always like, oh, like over time, they don't necessarily take on the human forms. Like it can just be like a ball of heat press, like pressing mm -hmm. against your back or something that was, I mean, really unique. I haven't seen that before anywhere. So yeah, it's really I, cool you know, I really it. like the ideas of ghosts being like a memory or an echo. Uh -huh. And so that to me, it was like, well, sometimes memories are extremely detailed and powerful. And then sometimes you start to forget them. And it's sort of this, this hazy memory that you, you, you have, mm -hmm. but you can't recollect it. And so if that were a ghost, like what would that look like? Some would be very sharply defined. And then some would be just sort of a nostalgic feeling. Were any of the beliefs that you put into this ghost system based on any of your own beliefs of the afterlife? I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not religious. Um, I guess maybe somewhat spiritual. I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I, I do believe like you put, try to put good out there. Maybe you get some good back. It doesn't always work that way, but I still believe in like trying. Um, so I guess it's sort of maybe like a vague sort of karmic kind of belief system, but you know, I, I want ghosts to be real. I've never seen one so I 
I can't say that, you know, they are or not. I, I wish I like believed really strongly. I wish I had like proof. Um, but no, for me, it's more like, well, I'll just, I'll just hope. I'll hope that there's something after. I don't necessarily, not in like a religious sense, but I think it would be nice if our energy or consciousness kind of carried on in a way. Did you encounter any challenges when you were building your ghost world? Like things, like I know when I was, cause I also have a book about ghosts and I know when I was writing it, I would always like come up with some system for the ghost and then I would write a scene and then the ghost would do something that I had previously said was impossible to do. And I kept yes. writing myself into a corner. I don't know if you experienced that too. Oh yeah, it happens all the time. Cause like, I need something to happen. I'm like, oh, uh, yeah, the ghost will like dive through this person. I was like, oh no, that, that's not gonna do anything. No, you already said that that doesn't work. So it's like, okay, yeah. well then they have to, I guess, like dive into a light, you know, like <laughs> you you want things to happen, but you've already made these rules. And so it's like, eventually right. you have to like write down your rules. It's like, you big X, can't do this, <laughs> can do this. Like here, here's, you can't just have this, you know, Deus is ex machina at, at the end where the ghost can do right. something that, because that's frustrating as a reader to me Definitely. to be like, well, they never did that before. Why all of a sudden is that possible? Yeah. So yeah, definitely had to like rewrite some stuff, you know, yeah. <laughs> or being like, wait, no, that does not make sense. They can't do that. Yeah. So when you were plotting out your books, um, like what, especially your mystery book, The Missing Presumed Dead, it is at its heart a mystery and these characters have to go find a murderer. Did you plot that book backwards or forwards? Did you know it was going to happen at the end and figure out how they were going to find the killer or the other way around? It, this one... <sighs> I told myself, I was like, I'm not going to write another mystery. This was, this was too <laughs> difficult. Um, and of course I'm like, I'm going to try this again. Um, I knew the motive. Mm -hmm. I wasn't entirely positive about who the like killer was going to be. I went back and forth between a couple of choices that both could have fit mm -hmm. um, and ended up writing, you know, one draft with one, rewriting it with another, deciding, you know what, that doesn't really work. And then going back and, and, going with my original idea. Um, right. I, I think for me, it's always important to have, and especially with horror, you often fall into like third act problems um, mm -hmm. just because the reveal of like the killer or, you know, the, the, the final scene sometimes is a letdown after all the buildup. Right. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that I had sort of, I had the ending in mind, even mm -hmm. if I didn't know like the specific details keeping track of all of the different plot lines and the clues and everything is so hard yeah yeah it's it's not and it's I think the next time I do this which I again I'm, I'm trying now it's like you it's really helpful to read other people's mysteries especially you know just like real quick thrillers and and you know you you go or even just like Agatha Christie stuff like short stories and things like that um where you sort of get you get how how everything fits together um and it's just it's such a hard thing to construct. It really yeah, feels so. like you're building something <laughs> when you're plotting a thriller. So what does your editing process look like? Well, I take a lot of time with my first drafts. I'm not a very fast writer. Um, when I'm drafting, I usually only do like a thousand words a day um, mm -hmm. just because I think about things a lot and I like to have most of my plot in my head um, before I write the book. Um, so I get, because I take a long time. And again, it takes me like, I don't know, six months to a year to write a first draft. Um, and I'm very careful with it. My editing process is usually a little bit more streamlined because it's not so much trying to rework the plot as it is going through and just fixing details um, as opposed to doing huge rewrites. Right. So I'd say I go through like two rounds of edits before it's out of place where I'm happy, like having other people look at it. Um, right. And then, you know, from there you get edit letter and all, all that. So once it's in everybody else's hands, that's much easier though, because then I just do what they tell me. <laughs> do you um, like edit as you go? Like after you write your words for the day, do you look them over and tweak them as you go? I, I don't usually, at, like not at the end of the day, if I, at some point while I'm drafting, decide I want to make a change, I will go back and change it before I keep going. So I know some people when they're drafting, they will just say, well, I'll fix that later and they keep going. I can't do that. It like messes with my head. I have to go back and change it when I have the idea. Otherwise it, I, I can't keep going. It's just like a weird mental block. So <laughs> I, do, I do edit as I write if, if I'm changing the plot. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of times that's necessary when that thing affects later scenes. Right, if it's a big enough thing, it's like, well, I, you know, it, you really can't just go back and fix it if it's if it's something, you know, 
sort of foundational. Yeah, because you don't want to spend all of that time writing stuff that you're going to have to delete anyway. Right, so this doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's, it's oh, such a pain. <laughs> <laughs> do you outline your books beforehand or do any sort of outlining? Yeah, I so I usually, I don't do like a super detailed outline. Like I don't do the bullets and points and stuff, but I usually have sort of like, um, like a timeline. Mm-hmm. Um, n- not like with detailed times, but sort of like, um, I know what the big scenes are going to be. And I always like to m- make sure that I know um, sort of the pivotal scene. So I want to know what the climax is going to be and what yeah. the ending is going to be. And then any sort of pivotal scenes that I want to make sure that I put in. Um, mm-hmm. And I just kind of do it in a chronological order for the book. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really hard to write thrillers when you don't have some sort of outline to go off of. I'm yeah. in awe yeah, of right. people who can just pants their way through thrillers. Yeah, no, it's hard because they'll just go off. I'll just go off on a tangent. I need I need to know where it's going or it, it, yeah. it just won't work. Yeah. Do you have any plot beats that you like using when you're outlining? Like, are there ones specific to the horror genre that you want to make sure that you have in there? Or do you follow like three act structure or a more standard story? Yeah, I usually do like a three act structure. I do think it's really important with horror to have like a big climactic scene where you're either confronting the villain or like truths are revealed, something like that. And it's usually with horror, it's usually very close to the end because you don't really want to do a long wrap up in horror because it sucks all the tension out. Um, So, but I always like to make sure I know what like the big confrontational scene is going to be or like the final face down with the killer, that kind of thing. So with mysteries and thrillers, it's often kind of a challenge to keep your readers turning pages because you always want to make sure that it's fast paced enough to keep them very interested. Do you have Mm -hmm. any tips for keeping the pace fast and writing page turning books? Yeah, so well, my my first book, what I did um, is I kept the chapters extremely short. So to the point where they're every like, I'd say five pages or so there's a new chapter, um, which just really sort of gives you, I think a chance of like the the sense of propulsion because you're reading really quickly and it's like a new chapter, a new scene. Um, And also when I do longer chapters, what I try to do is um, end a chapter with like a slight cliffhanger almost to to Mm -hmm. sort of catapult you into the next scene because otherwise I think some of the pauses can suck the tension out and a way to like keep people, you know, engaged and keep going is to like, oh, I have to know what happens next because that's like a moment that needs to be resolved. Um, yeah. Because, you know, what you want in a thrill, you don't want there to be a good place for you to like stop and put the book down. Yeah. You know, that's kind of the opposite of what you want. You want people to be up all night reading it, having, mm-hmm. you know, having to know what happens next. Yeah, definitely. I should have asked this question earlier on interview and I completely forgot to, but, and I also know that this is a super annoying question to get, but how do you come up with your ideas and do you have a process for coming up with your ideas or like writing down ideas as they come to you and combining things or? Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of them just start as sort of like random what ifs. Um, but I'd say like most of my ideas come from reading other books or watching movies or TV shows and I'll see something that I think is really original and inspires me or I'll, I'll read a sentence that sort of sends me on like a path like oh I wonder if this is going to happen and then if it doesn't happen I'm like well that would have been a cool idea too maybe yeah. I can use that for something else yeah. um and then especially because I write horror I like to sort of look at the genres within horror and like mm-hmm. what might be fun to you know check my list off so it's like I've got a zombie book I've got a ghost book you know I'm, I'm writing a slasher book um what I'd you know I'd like to do sort of like an exorcism book or um, a found footage book like those kinds of things and then when I you know I have those as just sort of like nebulous ideas and then when I come up with something specific that might fit that's when I sort of start getting deeper in, into the plotting of it what is your best piece of advice for someone that wants to become a horror author or any author at all? I mean, just just read read as much of the genre as, as you can um, because that's really how you how you learn how to write it and it's how you learn about your audience. Um, and yeah, that's, I mean, the best writing teacher you can have is, is other books. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I, especially for horror, you, ideas come from all over the place. Like think of the things that scare you specifically yeah. and put those in your books because I guarantee you other people are scared of the same things you know like I have weird eye trauma because I've got bad eyes so like anything with eye trauma like really freaks me out yeah. so you know I try to 
put stuff like eye trauma in my books, you know, things that would scare me and make it, you know, make it specific. And I think you'll, you'll find people that have the same sort of fears. Do you have any pieces of advice? Because when you're writing horror, it, you can't rely on any visual like jump scares or any visual mm-hmm. things like you can in movies. Like you have to rely on description and plot to kind of give readers this unsettling feeling. Do you have any advice for creating creepy scenarios in writing compared to if you were like watching a movie? Yeah, I would say, I mean, one of the sort of big things that, that movies do too is you you don't want to be um, sort of overly descriptive with your your monsters, things like that. I mean, you know, famously Jaws, the shark didn't work. So they don't have a lot of shots of the shark and it makes it so much scarier because you're not seeing it. And it, it, it looks kind of silly when you do see it. <laughs> but so a lot of times like the reader's imagination is going to be scarier than anything that you can come up with. Right. So, you know, allow them to fill in the blanks, you know, let your characters see something terrifying, but they only catch a glimpse of it. And Mm -hmm. someone's imagination is going to fill in something that's going to be terrifying for them because it's going to be their own worst fears. Right. Oh yeah. No, that's a really good piece of advice. I haven't thought about that before. (laughs) So what do you think is the secret to writing really scary horror? I, I mean, I think just, just, finding sort of these universal fears that we have. I mean, so much of it is about the unknown. It's about, you know, like what happens after we die? What is in the deep ocean that we can't see? What is in space that we can't see? Yeah. Um, you know, what, what are we, af- are we, af- we're afraid of our bodies being taken over, you know, whether by like demons or a parasite or like, you know, a zombie bite, like these are very um, human fears. And I think horror is such a great way to, to explore that. And because they're so universal, I mean, these, these, we've been making these kinds of movies and books, you know, for forever. Yeah. Um, and, and I think there's no sort of limit to the fears that we can explore and, you know, what, what they're a metaphor for and, um, how like ingrained they are yeah These are things like you know kids are afraid of of the dark sort of in you know just innately and and they shouldn't be because you know they're kids they're, they're not supposed to know like they don't know that a stove is hot right. until they, they touch the stove and we say you know they learn that that the stove is hot but kids are just afraid of the dark sort of intrinsically and yeah. that's just something very human and like this this lizard part of our brain is like the dark is scary because we can't see enemies coming yeah and so things like that just just you can always find ways to explore them that's that's super cool yeah and now I, I feel like I've learned so much talking to you I'm like all motivated to go right now <laughs> Good, yay! Job done. <laughs> okay, well, um, thank you so much for coming to talk to me today. Those are all the questions that I have. Do you want to tell everybody where they can find you online? Sure. Um, I'm on Twitter all the time. <laughs> it's uh, EE Berquist. Um, you can also find me on Instagram, same thing, EE Berquist. Um, and yeah, you're just my website. You can always email me if you're bored. I'm around. <laughs> I put all of, yeah, I'm going to put all of your social media links in the description of the YouTube video so people can find you. Um, Thank you again so much. This has been so much fun. Yeah, this is great. Thank you for having me.